Welcome to Hack Your Happiness. I was a kid growing up in the 90s and I was lucky enough to watch Canada's first ever female astronaut, Dr. Roberta Fonder, go to space. And uh, I thought, oh my gosh, Canadian women can do that. I want to do what she does. Are you a teen or adult looking for more happiness in every day and ways to connect with people in your life? You've come to the right place. Hack Your Happiness is a podcast designed to bring you the behind the scenes of what brings iconic individuals happiness, plus their life hacks. I'm Mercedes and I'm Anastasia and we're the two teens behind Small Bits of Happiness. We're interviewing Olympic athletes, entrepreneurs, celebrities, and more. Throughout all of our episodes, you'll find great conversations, hacks that you can take away and try in your life, inspiration as well as unique and surprising insights. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Shauna Pandya. When you're starting out, you don't have the luxury of hindsight. What are you most nervous and most excited about for going to space? We've been training for almost a decade now. So I am your top three tips for teens for overcoming this feeling of nervousness. I can tell you about a time when I did experience fear. Your advice to teens for how we can prepare ourselves for a challenge. Do I make my teammates lives better or or do I make it worse? What is one hack to build resilience? Not something we're born with, but it's something that we can actually accrue with practice. So there are so many aspiring teen astronauts out there. What would you recommend for them to do? This is truly the best possible time to become involved. Welcome to Hack Your Happiness. Welcome, Dr. Pandia. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yes, us too. You are an iconic doctor and astronaut. I know that Anastasia and I have been wanting to have an astronaut on for the longest time because we just think your work is, is so cool. So take us back to the beginning of your journey as a teenager. How did you find your interest in space and medicine? Yeah, my story actually starts even a little bit earlier than that. I was a kid growing up in the 90s, and I was lucky enough to watch Canada's first ever female astronaut, Dr. Roberta Fonder, go to space. And uh, I thought, oh my gosh, Canadian women can do that. I want to do what she does. And so um, I thought, well, to do what she does, I just need to um, follow her path. I need to go be a neuroscientist, a physician, and then an astronaut. And so I, by the time I got to high school, I knew I was going to apply to a neuroscience degree and then go to medicine and um, along the way I remembered that I had this space flight dream and applied to do a master's at the International Space University in um, Strasbourg France as well and then uh, for the longest time it was neuroscientist and physician with an interest in space medicine and then as of this summer um, I also get to add astronaut to that title. We just want to quickly say, check out our happiness wellness products designed by us for individuals of all ages to help you bring a small bit of happiness to your home with our tangible tips and tools. Check them out in the show notes. That is so cool. I love how, you know, you saw like what you wanted your career to be and what your goals were and you just went for it and you're like, I can do this. Like, of course, that's not an easy path. Like, that's a lot of school and that's a lot of work. But like, obviously you're super passionate and I just think it's so cool how you can find a goal and just go for it. Yes. And I mean, your journey sounds amazing. Like having that kind of goal and being able to achieve that must have so much determination and ambition. But throughout your journey, what do you think your most significant challenge has been and how did you overcome this? You know, I think when you're starting out, you don't have the luxury of hindsight. And so it's you're starting out to achieve a really ambitious, really big dream and you're taking steps to achieve it. And it's by no means easy. You know, you have to have the grades. You need to be a good team player. You need to be well-rounded. You need to um, have show you there's more to you than just um, studying and just this one ambition. And, you know, for example, I was a competitive athlete in Taekwondo for a very long time. Um, and so it's you need to believe in the the passion behind your dream. You need to believe in yourself and your ability to get there. Um, and then also it can't be just about the end goal. You have to enjoy every minute of the journey along the way. Um, and so for me, I've always been lucky in that I've been surrounded by really good people, both professionally and personally. And um, you know, it's uh, when I'm when I'm doing too much. I have people that tell me to dial it back, and when I, you know, when I'm in my best moments, I've, uh, you know, my friends, my family, and my colleagues cheering me on. Oh, so you know, it's so important to have that supportive community, but at the same time, that are not always 
pushing you to go ahead, which is important, but also telling you it's okay to slow down a bit. It's okay to take a break because for us to be at our best potential, we need to be able to take breaks. We need to be able to relax, which yeah. I love. I love what you said there about not having the luxury of hindsight because I think there's so many situations and circumstances where we can look back and be like, why was I so stressed about that? Like everything turned out great, but at that moment, you don't know. So it's it's kind of a, it's a, kind of a tricky tricky situation sometimes yeah and mercedes you know i mentor a lot of young folks um, at all aspects of their career from high school to undergraduate to medical students to folks in the space sector and um you know what i've started to see is that like and i why well, i've been there myself you know um you you can agonize over really hard decisions and ultimately they're both good decisions and for me that came when i was accepted to both medical school and the master's program at the International Space University in the same year. And for the longest time, I agonized about it. It's like, which one should I do? Um, and ultimately what I ended up doing was asking for a deferral to medical school, acknowledging that, you know, that was my priority and that I would go do that, um, but that I really didn't want to forget about the space dream. And this, this my faculty at the University of Alberta believed in the, the vision and my um, that path, and they, they granted it. So there were a couple of lessons learned there in that, you know, seek out a supportive work and academic environment that believes in your vision, um, that's going to act as a catalyst rather than a hurdle when you're trying to do things that are off the beaten path. Um, um, but coming to those who may be starting out in their career is that drive and that spark that inspires you to search for big goals, applying to, you know, really tough to get into programs, pursuing really hard athletic, rigorous training schedules, um, you know, pursuing a career as a performer. That drive comes from within you. So whether whatever decision you make, um, rest assured, when you have the luxury of hindsight, it's truly what I've learned is there is no bad decision. If you are doing your best, you're working hard, and you're surrounding yourself by a very supportive network, um, what you end up doing comes from that drive within, and whether you choose program A, program B, um, decision A, decision B, there's truly no wrong answer. Oh, I love that, because it's true, like, when you are surrounded by people who elevate you, it just makes a very challenging process just that bit easier and people who believe in you and I love that story about how your faculty supported you and now you're doing such cool amazing things and going to space so what are you most nervous and most excited about for going to space? For going to space, I don't think there's any nerves at this point. Um, I've been lucky enough to have been part of the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences for nine years and counting now. I've been part of um, 10 parabolic flight campaigns, both inside and outside of AAAS. Um, very comfortable in microgravity. And so um, I'm, I feel very ready. And knowing that I get to go to space with the team that I do, including Kelly Girardi, Nor Dr. Nora Patton, you know, they've been incredible to work with this whole time. So it's not nerves. It is, um, there is recognition that there is a whole team behind us who've been supporting us, um, that there's a lot of science in a very short period of time and it, the performance and the execution has to be spot on. It kind of is like, you know, being a star athlete and having a limited amount of time to showcase your stuff and perform at your best. So I'm mindful of that. Um, but this is kind of what we, we've been training for, for almost a decade now. So I am extremely excited to represent an institute that I'm very proud to be a part of. And then, um, I do really get excited um, and joyous at the thought of viewing the Earth from space. I really, really look forward to that. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. That's going to be, be such an amazing so experience. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, we watch like space shows where you're able to see footage of you know the earth from space but i feel like it would just like I, I don't know i don't have any experience i've never been to space before but like i feel like the experience of being able to like be up there and being able to see it for yourself is just so phenomenal and it, it would yeah. just be so amazing yeah, i'm excited for you on that note Thanks. And I also, I love how you're not nervous because I feel like so yeah. many people would be like, oh my gosh, like I'm doing this experience that so few, like not a lot of people have gone to outer space, but I love how you are like, you're ready, you've been training for years and you're confident in yourself and in your team. And I love 
that and I love the connection to sports because I think it's much the same like in the sense of like yeah you have to trust those around you and rely upon them as well as yeah, yourself for sure yeah and um you know even though you're not exactly feeling the most nervous what do you think your top three tips for teens would be for overcoming this feeling of nervousness yeah, totally. I can tell you about a time when I did experience fear and anxiety when I didn't expect to. And um, that was when I was completing my accelerated free fall solo skydiving license. And I, you know, I've never been afraid of heights, never been afraid of flying. And then I got into the door of that aircraft, 14,000 feet above the earth, ready to jump. And then I realized I wasn't afraid of heights. I was afraid of jumping from heights. And that's a really interesting um, realization to come to when you're about to jump out of a plane. And so really it, it took rationalization, repetition and preparation. And so what I mean by that is it, the rationalization was looking back in the plane and realizing that, you know, I could always make a choice to not jump out of that plane and just ride back to the ground in shame. Um, but also looking around at all of the happy, smiling people who'd both jumped before me and who um, were still in the plane and who'd done it before. Spoiler alert, they'd made it out alive. They were happy to be doing this. Um, so there was a method to this. It wasn't simply jumping out of a plane with no training, no backup planning for contingency and off nominal scenarios. And, you know, I had a parachute and a backup parachute. So that was the rationalization. The repetition was doing it over and over. It's not to say I jumped once and then my fear was cured. Um, you know, I had suboptimal jumps. I had jumps where I was spinning out of control because I didn't have the right body position or, you know, I wasn't pulling my chute at the right time um, or I landed a little bit too far from the landing zone. So, you know, you have to take those lessons and then debrief with yourself on how you can do better. So that was the um, repetition part of it. And the preparation, you know, when you're going through your ground school, you learn what you're looking for when you're ready to jump, um, how you jump, how you maintain your body position, how you um, navigate through, um, through the air as you're free falling, when you would pull your jump, uh, when you would pull your chute, how you're looking for an off nominal versus a nominal chute opening, when you would pull your backup chute, and then how you do your break falls. So like all of that, you know, that preparation needs to be there. You don't jump and cross your fingers and hope it's going to be okay. So I think those skills are translatable to, to anything, um, whether it's public speaking, whether it's entering your first um, singing contest, whether it's athletic performance, you know, it is the rationalization, repetition, repetition, preparation that'll get you there. I love that. Especially I think the rationalization part yes. is such an important first stage because when we realize that we're not the first and we're not the last to face a certain fear, whether it is going on stage and giving a speech or, you know, submitting an essay or applying for a school or a program. Like or even not, going to space. Exactly. <laughs> not the first and not the last. And so no, knowing that other people have made it through and enjoyed the process or at least, you know, been okay at the end of it is such a comfort. And also, you know, doing it over and over, building into a habit and being comfortable with that little bit of uncomfort, I think is also important. For sure. And yeah. I also love when you talked about repetition because you know your fear isn't going to go away the first time that you know you move past it it's a whole process of you know outgrowing it and moving past it because having a fear i feel like is almost your way of like protecting yourself against this but if it's a fear that you know you need to conquer to move forward to achieve your dream as long as it isn't like really dangerous <laughs> i think that just knowing especially if, if you doing it over and over again that you were able to do it last time and maybe you spun out of control but you were still able to keep going. You still were covered and you're here now. And so it's okay. You can do it again and you're yeah. just getting and better. And the fact of like what you said, you can't get to a better version of yourself if you yeah. never face those nerves, if you never feel a little bit uncomfortable. So I think it's knowing like this is going to, overcoming this will help me be a better me in the future. Yeah, I think, you know, that's a really important point is, you know, 
why am I doing this? Figure out your why. Like if, if this goes well, you know, what's going to, what's going to be the next step? You know, if I master this skill, like where am I going to go next? And also the other part of it is directed practice. Like how did that performance go? You know, sometimes it can be painful to watch your performance, whether it's the video of how you had a suboptimal jump out of a plane or, you know, whatever it is, your athletic performance, or even just reviewing your test scores. So you learn from your mistakes going into, um, each, um, activity and viewing it as a growth opportunity is also going to help increase and accelerate your progress of where you are versus where you want to be. Oh, I love that. You know, finding the why and letting that be your guide, I think is, is really helpful, especially when you feel like you don't know exactly why you're doing this, remembering that. Um, so obviously, like you said, you've been preparing for space and studying this realm for years now, but could you give us a little, little tidbit on what does training and preparation for space look like? Yeah, definitely. So we, um, when we talk about what it takes to be a solid top tier operator in um, a microgravity environment, really you need to practice, practice, practice. You need to know the choreography of the scientific payload or experiment that you're operating inside, outside, backwards, forwards, in your sleep. You need to know how you're going to act in the microgravity environment. And you also need to have a lot of microgravity practice because there's a certain way to um, navigate versus not navigated microgravity um, and then also planning for the best case the worst case the most likely case scenarios and then also knowing how you're going to act with another operator or scientist if there if there are multiple people required to operate a payload and then if there is a um, cabin full of other researchers, investigators, or folks doing their own thing, how you're going to de-conflict with them. So all of those considerations really come into play. It's something that we've been practicing with our parabolic flights for years now at um, the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences. And then um, really the our crowning achievement prior to the announcement of our ISO 2 flight was our first research flight with my good friend and colleague. Kelly Girardi, she was our first research astronaut and she really embodied all of these elements of practice, performance, and execution. Um, she made sure she knew what she was doing at every second of her um, phase of microgravity and we had checklists, we had refined checklists, she knew what she was doing, she knew where her body was in space, she knew um, where um, her um, you know, where her colleagues would be in the cabin. So, it, you know, it's really something that comes from experience and striving to perform at our best and get better every time. I love that. And I love, you know, the amount of preparation that goes into it, like the best yes. case scenario, the worst case scenario, the most likely. And I think that's something that even others, like teens can apply to exactly. our own life. Like, if I do this, what's the best, like say I apply to a dream school or I apply to a dream program, what's the best thing that would happen? What's the most likely thing that will happen based on, you know, maybe the average, my own achievements, and then what's the worst thing that will happen? And I think that can also help you navigate tough choices. Exactly. Life. But I also think that once you realize, you know, I'm comfortable with what the worst case scenario is, that if the worst case scenario, hopefully it doesn't happen, but if it does happen, you firstly maybe know how to cope with it. You know how that you have like a plan on, you know, if I get an F on this test and I need, you know, to, to get honors, I need to get this on my final, you know, you kind of plan out, this is exactly how I'm going to do everything because you plot it out, you understood this is the worst case scenario and I'm okay if I get an F as long as I'm able to then do better on my final. Um, and I also love how you talked about like knowing the most likely case scenario because there's never just black and white. There's always going to be an in-between area and knowing that and then being able to be comfortable with like a D <laughs> is um, also like a good way to feel yeah. more comfortable with what might actually happen. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer and a proponent of uh, learning the art of the debrief. And this is something I learned from our zero G campaigns, but anytime I do anything operational, whether it's skydiving, piloting, um, or, you know, even if it's um, a grant I applied for that maybe didn't have the outcome that I liked is, you know, you're reviewing your performance and you're reviewing it through the lens of 
emphasizing the patterns of performance that led to success so you can replicate those in the future, and then also dissecting what didn't go so well so that you have a plan, um, you can analyze why it happened, and then how you will be prepared for it the next time you encounter that scenario. I love that, the art of the debrief. I love it. Yes. <laughs> and also, so, you know, you have an absolutely amazing and extremely exciting career. <laughs> but like you said, um, you sometimes need to take some downtime, and I'm sure that you have a very <laughs> time-consuming of time that you spend working on everything. And preparing. Exactly. But how do you find a work-life balance in your day-to-day -day life? Yeah, I think it's sort of like, use, to use an engineering term, is it's like having these internal sensors. And for me, if I, my internal sensors, there's certain things I like to do every day and working out is one of them. And if I am so ensconced in work and in deadlines um, to the point where I am missing working out too many days in a row, then the internal sensor goes off that's saying like, this isn't sustainable, you're gonna become grumpy, you're gonna hate your life, uh, and you're not gonna be very fun to work with, or you're gonna be um, not, you're not going to perform very well or be very, be very effective if you continue down this path towards burnout. So kind of taking that dedicated time every day to just recharge and take time for myself is really critical. And for me, missing out on too many days of working out, for example, um, is just a really critical indicator that, you know, this is not the best way to go about things. I love that because like you said, as you take that path towards burnout, like in any realm, having that dedicated time is so helpful because then it's it's like you know what you should be doing and kind of more or less when. Like for example, you could say every day at 5.30, I'm gonna take a break and I'm gonna go for a 30 minute walk. I know that that's something we love to do is like have it in our routine and build that into mm -hmm. a habit. And just out of curiosity, what do you like to do for your workout? You know, I switch it up. Um, I love cardio and then um, also a big believer in weight training. So typically my workouts will be about 90 to minutes to two hours. Um, and I try to do an hour of cardio and then um, weights. And so the cardio will be anything from skipping. Like I just, especially when I've had too much screen time with skipping, you cannot be on your phone. You cannot be doing anything other than in the moment, listening to some really good music. Um, and then the other cardio I do will be anything from going for a run to being on the recumbent the, to the elliptical um, so that's what my cardio routine will look like and then weights will be anything from free weights with lots of abs in there to just doing um, a circuit on the weight machines if I'm in the gym um, and just you know making sure I'm getting a full body workout switching it up um, and that you know also having a lot of forgiveness. Um, so some days it's simply showing up to the gym uh, and realizing that today's not gonna be the day I'm gonna set a personal record. Um, I just got back from an overseas trip recently and the next day I was in the gym, very, very jet lagged, half asleep on all of the machines and really just showing up to the gym and just having that bit of forgiveness or grace um, and you know saying, okay, today's gonna be the day I'm still at the gym, but you know, on cardio, I'm gonna take a machine that allows me to catch up on email versus um, today is gonna to be a day I need to unplug and I'm just gonna go skip for one hour. So it really is, you know, realizing that every day is gonna be a little bit different and it's okay that to be, um, give yourself grace on the days when the performance may not be there. I love that. I think that's so important because, you know, like you said, sometimes we do need to just show up. I think showing up is just so important because, you know, you're creating the habit of just being disciplined and knowing I don't really feel like it, but I know that once I get there, I'm going to feel much better and I'm going to be able to do it. And um, also like, you know, creating that habit, knowing last time I didn't want to go here and I still came, I came out of it feeling better than before. So then also having kind of stuff that you can look back on. Um, but I just love, you know, you being able to have something that you love, like working out that, you know, you have different like routines you can do like, oh, I want to unplug, I'm going to skip. Oh, I feel like I really want to run today. And you, instead of just having like one thing that you consistently stick with, because I think it can be easy to get sick of something if you overdo it. Uh, but as well as how you use that, like as an indicator of, you know, I don't think I've been getting enough downtime lately. I haven't been able to work out enough lately. I, I just think that's perfect. It's a good indicator. I yeah. love that. So kind of on the same note, being a doctor and preparing for space flight, like you said, it involves tr preparing and training for the best case scenario, the most likely, the worst case scenario. Um, and so that's a lot of adversity and challenge prep. 
So we read that you've spent days underwater, led these test missions to Mars, and that's so cool. But what would you say is your advice to teens for how we can prepare ourselves for a challenge? Yeah, so um, a lot of the lessons from those austere environments, we call them analog environments because they're analogous to the space flight environment in some way, shape, or form. They may be remote, they may be resource limited. We call them ice environments for isolated, confined, and extreme environments. Um, so there's a lot of ways to think about it, um, but one that's really useful is when you're a teen, if you're in any facet of life, you're going to be doing a lot of teamwork, a lot of group work. Um, and it's one of my teammates from both the Mars and the underwater missions had a really good way of putting it is, do I, like my, do I make my teammates' lives better or do I make it worse? And so that means, you know, looking for gaps to fill in. Does one of your teammates, do one of your teammates, do they look task saturated? Do they look like they're overloaded with work? Um, do they, you know, do you need to offer to step in and share some of the tasks and deadlines that they have? Um, um, are they physically carrying something and you have nothing in your hands? Can you share the burden? Um, and as a teammate, that also means having the, the fortitude to be vulnerable enough to communicate your pain points. So it's sort of like saying, I am underwater, I'm slammed with deadlines this week, can you please take on this work or even communicating with this partner this week. Um, so it requires a lot of communication um, and then also realizing how you communicate with each other. Um, so I often like to say in medicine we're speaking English but not the same language because the technical ways in which we understand disease states or read radiological reports is not the same way in which we're going to communicate results and the severity um, of a result to a patient. Um, and so realizing what everyone's understanding is, and then even taking a step back from that, developing that shared mental model for success, what are success criteria, how are we gonna get that, um, get there together? And then also realizing that when we're in these dynamic operational environments, there's a pattern to how we communicate. And in non-emergent, lax scenarios, it's simply, you know, getting everyone's feedback, you know, communicating by questions, suggestions, and then when things become more urgent or things need to be get done quickly, talking or issuing um, your communication in a statement format, and finally, when things are really emergent, um, issuing commands. Um, if there's a fire in the hab, you, there's no there's no time to say, do you think that we should get out of the hab? It's everybody out of the hab now. Meet at the muster point. Um, don't take anything with you. Um, so it's there's a lot of a lot of nuances to communication, and the sooner on you learn how critical that is to getting to the end goal, getting there successfully and happily, um, you know, the more ahead of the game you'll be. That's, I love that. Yeah. I think communication is always so important because if you're not able to communicate or see, oh, you know, um, this person is carrying a lot of a burden, I think that it's a good idea if we split it or if you're just not picking up on other people's signals or if you're carrying a lot of the weight of the group and you realize that nobody else really is and being able to communicate and say, hey, can we uh, split this? Hey, can we share this? Um, is so important because yeah. communication is key I also, to really anything. I really like how you said like evaluate the situation like if you need to say hey everyone we need to get out like that's more of a command format don't say that if there's not really a time pressure pressure because it can make others feel belittled but in terms of teamwork like evaluate the situation and see how you can best communicate to people in your environment and don't be afraid to question assumptions and start from first principles there may be an assumed um fact of of um of statement that is there, um, but don't be afraid to you know do your own sleuthing and come to your own conclusions. And also, if you see, feel something's amiss, say something. So that happens in medicine all the time. Um, there's this code word that we use as healthcare workers that's not as far as I know, which truly means I don't know. And we should normalize saying I don't know and making it safe and okay to say that. Um, and then also, anytime you know, even if I have really good handover from a really good doctor that I trust, I also need to start from basic principles and get the whole story. So for any patient who's ever wondered, you know, why you have to tell the same story to the triage nurse, the nurse, the doctor, the medical student, it's because we all want to make sure that we're not missing anything and that we're also getting extra information. Um, and so, you know, here's a really simple example of how it's important to question uh, assumptions. So I was in London Heathrow um, a few weeks ago, and to get to the train, you had to go down the elevators to the buses, and there was a very, very long line, and you had to keep waiting for the elevator. And I think the assumption was it was because the elevators kept coming with such regularity that at some point someone was assuming that someone was always pushing the button 
to chat to call the next elevator. And I was watching this very carefully because everyone just fell into this pattern of thinking someone else would do it. And I watched for about a minute or two to see if anyone would catch on at this very long lineup that everyone was just assuming this had been done. And of course, no one had, had pushed the, the button to call the next elevator. It was just assumed it was done. And so, you know, I just stepped out, pushed the elevator, came back to my place, and then everyone just like, oh, we were assuming. And so, you know, that's a very innocuous, simple, everyday scenario. But when you escalate that to emergency scenarios, you do need to be more direct about it. Like I have literally walked into code situations and said, who is in charge here? Do you want to be in charge? No. Are you okay with me be taking charge? And you just need to have that open, direct communication because, it, you know, in an everyday scenario, it's as silly as a, you know, assuming, you know, assuming the elevator is taking too long. But in an emergency room scenario, it can mean life or death. Yeah, that's a great example because I, I think that's that. something everyone has experienced or somewhat experienced and can relate to on some level because. Like, we always assume someone else will check it. Someone else exactly. will check my work. Someone else will take care of it. Someone else will, you know, take care of this issue. But sometimes it needs to be us because otherwise it won't get done or nobody will think about it. And so that's why we can, if we are passionate about achieving a goal, I think there's like, that's the flip side. Like, if we're passionate about achieving a goal, we can take it as far and, and achieve our goal because other people won't. But at the same time, like, if we're always waiting for someone else to, to step up, and that's preventing us from stepping up that can lead to issues in a lot of different realms and and so i really like that uh also what you said about um am i being a good teammate like and what is what i'm doing am i making my life my teammates life better because of my actions or am i you know not really contributing or am i actually making their job a little bit more tricky because of what i'm doing and kind of thinking would I want to be my own teammate and that's something I've learned to do is like <laughs> would I want to be partnered with myself on this task right now or on this project because sometimes I I think it's important to take a self-reflection moment oh, yeah, yeah. Take, having that degree of self-awareness and starting to develop it is so critical and it's really interesting that we saw this during the early days of the pandemic um, because there's this concept from the National Outdoor Leadership School that NASA and the all of the astronauts that they train embrace and it's called expeditionary behavior. And it's simply learning to be a good crewmate and teammate on expedition. And it's both looking out for the health of the team, making sure that you're advancing towards your shared goals, but also saying like, how am I doing? Am I too tired today because I can't sleep because of it's too loud? Um, you know, am I not, you know, am I feeling unwell? Communicating that because having your team know that is critical because we just may need to readjust things. And so bringing those principles back to our day-to-day -day lives with our families, our friends, you know, our siblings, it's sort of saying, okay, am I being um, good in this unit? And if not, you know, why? And, you know, maybe my teammate's not doing so well. Can I check in with them? Or, you know, what do I need today to be able to be a good teammate or roommate or, you know, family member? Exactly. And not assuming that they already know what's going on. I think oftentimes you might think that like, you know, we're kind of all mind readers and we all kind of understand like what's going on. But oftentimes if you don't communicate clearly, clearly, yeah. then it can be very hard for other people to adapt and to help you. And that's so important in, in, in preparing for a challenge. Exactly. So speaking of, you know, these challenges, have you ever encountered a challenge and you're questioning yourself whether you're actually able to solve this challenge? And if so, how did you overcome this self-doubt and keep going? Yeah, you know, I I love problem solving. Everything from word puzzles to the most challenging patient you have in the emergency room. It's it's really loving getting to the answer. And so how do you do that um, in the context of not being overwhelmed. So I come to everything with the hypothesis that every problem is solvable. And so then, you know, when you're dealing with this in as an individual or as a team, you know, saying what resources do I have at my disposal? Can I phone a friend because I don't know the answer? And we do that in medicine all the time. You know, I have expertise in one area, but you know, if I think that there's something out of my realm that the cardiologist may be able to answer, you better believe I'm calling the cardiologist. Um, and then I think, you know, recognizing mentalities that aren't um, super helpful. And so, um, you know, I have both in clinical, non-clinical scenarios, there are teammates that you see that they, they don't that last very long because um, they're, 
they're high catastrophizers in that everything, whether it's, you know, getting a hole in your sock um, to, you know, not knowing how to find the bathroom. And these are real life examples is, you know, the end of the world. And so you don't want to diminish someone's experience or feelings, but, you know, just problem solving saying, okay, um, rather than taking the mentality that this is the end of the world, like, how do I get to solving this problem. Okay, I don't know where the bathroom is. I will, um, you know, ask someone for it. So I think those are really un unhelpful um, characteristics that we can actually work to correct uh, through example uh, without diminishing someone's feelings. Um, and then, you know, if we see, um, you know, things that can border on toxic behavior, like always complaining without looking for a solution or working to correct that. I think that's fantastic advice because um, so many teens, I think we, something happens and it throws us off our trajectory and we're like, oh my gosh, like, what am I going to do? I don't know how to get back on my right path. I don't know what's happening. And so realizing like, is this really the best delegation of my energy? Like if I'm worrying about everything that comes my way, how am I ever going to withstand a major obstacle? And I also really love what you've said about calling in someone to help because yes. we want to be independent especially as teenagers we want to prove ourselves we, we're like we can do this I don't need to have a parent or a friend or a coach or a teacher or I, can, I can do it myself but realizing that like if you're feeling self-doubt in a situation maybe you don't know the answer maybe you don't know how to solve a math question maybe you don't know how to finish an essay like asking for help yeah. is the only way that we can learn like we can't just magically come up with answers exactly. if we don't have them in the first place. So like learning from others who are experts in any case is is really powerful. And even taking that first step of saying, okay, if I were to communicate my pain point to someone else, how would it sound? Because once you're starting to coalesce exactly what it is your pain point and asking that question, you may actually be able to answer the question yourself. And then also, you know, as teens, like when you're, you know, a really driven teen, you're doing a lot. You're going to school, you may have a part-time job, you may be part of um, some athletic teams, you may be part of student council, like there is a lot. And, you know, I think it's really a really useful time to prioritize and saying, okay, I have two major finals tomorrow. Today is the day I don't go to soccer practice. Today is the day I focus on the finals and learning to prioritize. And then also giving your grace that you're not failing because you didn't show up to one commu uh, commitment but you are actually succeeding because you've learned to successfully prioritize. Absolutely. We've, we've spoken to a, other people on the podcast about yeah. the same topic as well. And they're all like, it's all about how you can't do it all, but you, sorry, it's, you can't be a hundred percent at everything, but you can still mm -hmm. show up. Like if you're better off not always going to soccer practice, but when you do go, you try your best, but you can't always be doing your best at everything all of the time. It's just not sustainable. Yeah, I think kind of viewing, um, I, I fully subscribe to the mentality that there is a season for everything. So, you know, when folks ask me how I'm doing everything, it's I'm not doing everything in the same 24 hour period. Just as even if you know you're a star volleyball, soccer, basketball, lacrosse, field hockey athlete, you're not training for all of those things every single day. That would just lead to burnout and injury. Like there is a season when one thing becomes more important than the other. Um, and then the other part of it is, you know, um, kind of realizing, are you performing at the level you want to? And if you're not contributing too many days in the row, you know, are, is it better to just kind of let that one um, priority go or versus do you need to actually reprioritize? So those are all really important skills to, to learn early on. And, you know, there's always going to be a time and place when, um, you know, certain skills become or certain priorities become more important and I think viewing ourselves as gyroscopes um, in that we have to constantly change our our actions and our balance in relation to what's happening around us rather than being static and strong and then also reaching in this direction and that direction but just always being fluid. Absolutely and I think that the point to the seasons is so true especially when we're in school like during summer maybe your priority is your job and you're practicing for your sport but then once school comes around your priorities have to reshuffle and now maybe no job but school and a different sport and maybe you know supporting a parent if they are you know traveling a lot it, it is all about kind of knowing that it's okay for life to shift and nothing can stay the same forever so it's okay to let things change 100 percent, and i think it's so important to just like have that kind of mindset of knowing that I'm not going to be focusing all of my energy into everything. I'm not going to be able to have time for that. 
and it's not sustainable and being comfortable with saying, you know what, this is going to be a really easy week. I can focus more on soccer or I can focus more on doing this hobby that I like to do. But, you know, during finals week or if midterms are coming up or if you're you have to put your head down and get to work on diplomas, <laughs> it's OK for you not to be you know, doing your hobbies or it's okay to, you know, say, oh, you know, I'm too busy to go to soccer practice this week because you need to reshuffle and focus all your energy on that task. Totally. So in our research, we came across the fact that you say that resilience is something that we can learn, which I think is so awesome um, because sometimes we might be doubting our own resilience. So knowing that you can boost your own is pretty cool. What is one hack for teens or for anybody listening to build their resilience? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm really glad you brought it up. So when we talk about resilience, for those who don't know, we talk about psycholo psychological resilience. So that's grit mental fortitude, the ability to bounce back when you've had a setback or the ability to keep going even when you're performing in a very rigorous, high-paced, demanding schedule. And so um, the research actually shows that it's not something we're born with, it's not that you're more resilient than I am, but it's something that we can actually accrue with practice. It's just like a muscle that we need to flex. And so there's many models of resilience out there, but the one I subscribe to looks at resilience in terms of um, preparation for mental rehearsal, taking through yourself yourselves for the best and the worst case scenarios, um, impulse control, resisting the urge to be overwhelmed or to give up, breaking things down instead of saying, oh my god, I have three essays to write and they're all due tomorrow, saying, okay, I want to start with the first essay and I'm going to aim to have an outline done in the next 15 minutes, right? That's the first step. Um, the positive self-talk, so that's kind of akin to the impulse control rather than get, say, talking to yourself negatively, um, telling yourself that you've got this. And then finally, the fifth point is um, positive self a positive social support network. So surrounding yourself by people who know your abilities and who can also lift you up. And, um, you know, practicing that is as simple as saying the next time something bad happens you forget your lunch and saying oh my god the day's ruined I'm going to go hungry is well how might I problem solve this can you know I buy lunch from the cafeteria can I you know split lunch with my friend um, so you know just coming again from the basic principle that every problem is solvable is really really critical I love that that mindset every problem is solvable I feel like once you kind of believe that I firmly believe that a mindset can really shift the way that you do everything because if you come into a problem thinking that thinking every problem is solvable it makes it so much easier because you don't even have to think that much you're already like your brain's already jumping into all the different opportunities you could take or you know like this is how I'm going to start everything out instead of sitting there for a couple minutes kind of being like I have, I even I have three essays to write. <laughs> do I even have enough time to do this? So instead of like, you know, stressing out because, you know, it doesn't actually help you. You're sitting there worrying while you could be doing your essay outline <laughs> and, you know, yeah. cutting down on that. No, time. I really like the positive self-talk because I think when yes. you are filled with self-doubt, how are you going to produce your best results possible? And even more so, how can people believe in you if you don't even believe in you? Like you have to put that out there and you have to put what you want out there and then channel to, to lead to more successful solutions. Exactly, yeah. with less stress. And I, and I don't need, mean to say that we always need to tell ourselves everything is fine, that we're gonna get through this. I mean, that's what the positive social support networks are there for. Like my best friend and I have been best friends since we were 11, so a very, very long time. Um, and you know, we, you know, on our days when we're stressed out or, you know, when things are going, you know, like a mile a minute, you know, we will communicate our pain points and we come from very different worlds. She has nothing to do with space. She's a business analyst. Um, but it's sort of like the, you want this person to succeed. And then, you know, again, to this idea of communicating and communicating our pain points, we will literally ask ourselves today, do you just want to be heard or do you want a solution or do you want both or do you just want to rent, right? And then it helps us know how we should receive this information and how we should respond in a way that helps that person get through their day in a way that's a little bit better. Oh, I love that. That is so effective. I love exactly. it. Exactly. So, so many teens just aspire to be like you. They aspire to be astronauts. I definitely so did. Iconic. When I was younger, I really wanted to be, I wanted to go to space. I mean, who hasn't wanted to go to space <laughs> at one point? So there are so many aspiring teen astronauts out there, but what would you recommend for them to do to become closer to achieving this goal? 
Oh gosh, you know, that's such a great question. This is truly the best possible time to become involved and excited about space and space in Canada. Um, you know, with the rise of commercial space flight, with the fact that we have one of our Canadian space agency astronauts going to the moon on Artemis II, there is so much good stuff. So um, on a practical level, you know, as a student, there's many, there's more opportunities than ever, even at the high school level, there's opportunities for student clubs, student projects, robotics competitions, science experiments. At the university level, there's student groups like Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, where you can meet other like-minded students um, and, you know, develop projects together. And then also kind of asking yourself what you want your role in space to be. Do you want to learn about, go approach astronautics through science, through engineering, through Piloting. Um, do you want to be part of this growing um, path that is outside of the traditional path um, that isn't, you know, necessarily a STEM field? Do you want to be an artist, a storyteller? Because there is room for space in that now. So figure out what your role is and what you want it to be. Um, work really, really hard to get there. A work ethic is free, and then just act like you belong here because you do. Oh, I love that because I think it's so true. Like there are so many different realms within the realm of space that you can participate in, and so really identifying and maybe that means watching movies and shows yes. and TED Talks and learning about the stories of other famous astronauts like you did as a teen um, and kind of seeing how you could see yourself. Exactly. And I also think there are so many amazing school programs. Like, you know, I, I also heard about this amazing like, um, like F1 Academy at schools where you're able to like mm -hmm build cars and I don't know, I, I don't know I just somehow heard about it um well, like for example it's a great program to learn about physics and how like you know cars work which then I feel like just like vehicles in general almost like work similarly I know it's not exactly the same thing as a spaceship but like it's a starting point and you can see am I interested in this kind of stuff and just testing the grounds on you know space is such a huge industry saying oh i'm interested in space as a whole but i'm gonna just see you know what exactly i'm interested in so then when it goes to the point where i'm going to university i know kind of generally what i want to study and what i want to like be more specific in and what i want to be an expert in yeah, absolutely. And I think if I can plug um, one really great STEM initiative that I've become involved with, so that's SHAD Canada, that is applicable for um, high school students. Um, so it takes, you know, driven change agents at the high school level to summer programs um, all across Canada at campuses and charging them with, you know, really big problems. And, um, and taking, you know, ch tasking them to come up with solutions to this. And there have been some amazing initiatives that have come through this program. So I'm on the board for SHAD Canada, but my entry point was during the pandemic when we couldn't do um, our usual campus summer programs, I was asked to be a um, PI or primary, pr primary investigator or lead scientist for a suborbital payload to take um, a student-led engineering payload to space. And you know, these kids who were at the grade 11 level, incredibly brilliant, and just watching them let their creativity and their design flow and grow was just such a cool process. So just look for opportunities because they are out there. And then the final part of that is if there is no opportunity, create your own. So once I had finished up at the master's program at the International Space University and I came back to medical school, I was really bitten by that space medicine bug and just wanted to keep on learning about it. And there was no real avenue for that. And so I created the Space and Extreme Environment Medicine Club uh, at my medical school. And you know, that started to become a nidus for other like-minded students and it was just a really good way to start keeping that keeping that network growing I That's love fantastic. that fantastic yeah don't be afraid to, you know, make your own initiative and see who else is interested. I think that's fantastic. And I also thank you for sharing Shed Canada because yes. I think that's a great resource for uh, kids to check out and teens to check out if they want to learn more. And so you said, and earlier on today, you shared that, you know, you came across and you've been working towards the goal of going to space ever since you were even a preteen. And so I just wanted to kind of take us back there and ask what is one piece of advice that you wish you could share with your teenage self? Yeah, I think this comes back to our earlier part of the conversation is that, you know, all of those really hard decisions you make, like believe in that ambition and that spark within yourself and then just develop that work ethic because the difference between a, a dream versus an ambition is a plan. 
So, you know, dream plus plan equals ambition. So create that roadmap for yourself to get there. Um, work really, really, really hard. And then also have your backups and your contingencies and your plans A, B, C, and D. And, you know, set really, really, really big goals for yourself because you will be amazed at where you end up when you look back at your, your journey in hindsight. I love that. I know we were doing a podcast interview a few weeks back and one of the biggest takeaways I had was don't be the one to tell yourself no. Yes. And that's so applicable in this case. It's like, don't be the one to tell yourself that you can't go to space. Plenty of people out there will be in your way and tell you that that's too hard or you can't get into the program. So be the one to advocate for yourself and believe in yourself. And also, I saw this quote yesterday that I think really applies to this. I love <laughs> quotes if you can't tell. But it was like, it may not happen right now or it may not happen tomorrow, but if you give up, it won't happen at all. So be okay with the fact that this might be a multi-year process of you following your passion or following your ambition and developing this knowledge or getting towards whatever the goal might be in any case, whether that be going to the Olympics or publishing a book or going to space at some point. But if you give up, it's never going to happen. So it's better off happening four years from now than never. I love that so much. And I love what both of you <laughs> said. Both of those are absolutely amazing. And I just wanted to ask you this. We asked this to uh, all of our podcast guests. Do you do something every day that brings you a small bit of happiness? And if so, what do you do? Yeah, so we talked about working out and how important that is. So definitely working out. Um, and then two other plugs I'll put in is, you know, my best friend and I, she has to go to Australia a lot for work. So she'll be 17 hours away. I'm pretty much living out of a suitcase. So we're often in different time zones, but we are sending each other voice notes um, about the silliest parts of our day, just to kind of keep that bond going strong. And, you know, it's been through decades. So that's really, um, you know, it's, we, there's no doubt that we're in each other's corner. Um, and then um, for the pet lovers out there, I have a parrot. She's a lovebird. She's about 54 grams and just, she's like a, a small dog. She's, you know, we can teach her tricks and everything. And just making sure I spend time with this, this, lovely creature that trusts me to give her the best possible life and take care of her um you know that brings me a lot of joy oh i love that that's so cute and i love the voice notes and that's something that i love that so yeah, much that's a great way to stay especially if you don't live next to your best friend or maybe your cousin or sister um that's a great way to keep that bond going. i love the voice notes i feel like it's so much more personal like yeah like text, text messages yeah. are great but like and it's just like you can hear the yeah. other person's voice and like exactly like what they mean and what's nice about that is like if you can't facetime yes. or call because you live in different time zones then then at least that gives you some sort of connection and i'm just curious you said that you're living out of a suitcase where are you right now so I'm in Edmonton, Alberta briefly, um, but in two days I will be packing up again and I will be in Ottawa, Canada at the National Research Council. We are doing our annual zero-G flight campaigns with the um, through the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences and with the NRC. Um, and we, you know, this is something we do every year. There's a lot of science that goes into it. And so I'm incredibly excited to be doing that again. Um, and then over the past month, I was everywhere in Carson City with the, working with an air racing crew to uh, near by the NASA Ames campus in California for a conference to Oxford for um, a space initiative with their business school and most recently in Las Vegas so every day is like a box of chocolates uh, it's a little bit different um, and in my case it's a box of space medical chocolates oh that's so cool <laughs> that oh my sounds gosh. Amazing. amazing so we've talked a lot about quotes today but do you have a specific motivational quote that you love and remember and if so why yeah, there's a couple. Um, I think there's one from um, Vice President Kamala Harris that is, you can be the first, just make sure you're not the last. And so it's all about elevating others up with you and creating pathways that may have not been available to you when you're growing up. And then there's this one, it's it's often misattributed to Sir Winston Churchill, but in fact, it's, it's actually anonymous. And it's, um, su success is not final, failure is not fatal it's the courage to go on that counts oh i love that, I love that. they're both so great but i love the one that's like it's all about you know just keeping on going don't ever you know think that okay i achieved this now i now i'm done or okay i didn't <laughs> achieve this so i should just quit and do something different like keep, exactly keep trying exactly and i love that you know because sometimes we feel like, like we succeed and we're almost like too scared to keep going because what if we're not as good as last time yeah. but just kind of knowing like you did it you were able to do it last time and you were able to do it really well that you know you succeeded so now you know you can you can do it again and you can do it even better and exactly. just to keep going you don't need to 
always be better than everybody else. Just do better than you did last time. Absolutely. And, you know, I think the Olympics, I love watching our Canadian athletes just, you know, own the podium. You know, we've done it in hammer throw. We've done it in swimming. Um, and, you know, you don't get into the pool every single day and break a personal record. You know, you will have bad competitions. I've certainly had bad competitions um, as in Taekwondo. But, you know, it's sort of like, well, I'm not going to throw it in because I want to get back in to fight another day. And so how do I do better? How do I take time and recharge? So every day is going to another opportunity to succeed. A hundred percent. You have so many amazing things coming up, like you just said. Um, so do you have anything else that you have coming up that you'd like to share with us? Anything Any events, in particular? projects? Yeah, um, so I'm super excited to be reunited with my ISO 2 research team. We will all be in Ottawa next week, so that's really exciting. Um, there's a lot coming down the pipeline in terms of travel for the last part of the year. Um, so some of the things on my schedule include um, heading down to Milan, Italy for the world's biggest space conference, the International Astronautical Congress. So that happens every year in a different country. It was in Azerbaijan last year, and it will be in uh, Milan this year that will be exciting and then um, I am part of the World Extreme Medicine Organization which is the congregation of every extreme medic from underwater medicine to space medicine to Antarctica to conflict zone medicine just you know there's incredible people in that organization and so that annual conference will be in Scotland um, in um, November so there's going to be a lot more living out of a suitcase but you know it's just being surrounded by people who always make you want to do better and level up a little bit more, um, I think that would that's what keep me that is what keeps me going. Oh, I love that so I much! I'm that. so excited for you. We can't wait to follow along on your journey um, and all your amazing travels. So, where can our audience find you if they also would like to keep up and learn more? Yeah, totally. So, I am everywhere under the same name. So, you can find me at my website, shaunapandya.com, S H A W N A P A N D Y A, and then you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook as Shauna Pandya. Amazing. Well, thank you so thank much you so for much. joining us today, for sharing your story and your yes. insights. This is so inspiring. So thank you. This is really fun. Thank you so much for asking me and I look forward to our next encounter. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Hack Your Happiness. And thank you so much, Dr. Shauna Pandia, for joining us today. I mean, I've always wanted to speak with an astronaut, and so being able to meet with her today and hear all about her story and her advice has been just so cool. And CJ, what is your biggest takeaway? I think my biggest takeaway has definitely been that you need to do something again and again before actually overcoming your fear. I feel like sometimes we're like, I'm just gonna do this once and I'm just gonna become a different person. I'm not gonna be scared of this anymore, but that's not the way it works. We need to do it again and again. But the best part is that even if we do it while scared, that's still being brave and we can learn from the last time that we did it. What about you, Mercedes? Love that. And my hack that I got from speaking with Dr. Pandia today on how to overcome feeling nervous is the rationalized part. When you feel nervous about anything, think about and rationalize why you're feeling nervous. Have you done this before? Maybe you've heard negative things about it. Maybe you're just scared because it's unknown and uncertain to you. But also rationalize how it's going to be okay. Maybe this will help you take a big step towards your goal. Maybe you need it to, in order to get a good grade on an assignment at school, or it will help you develop your skills. Rationalize how other people have done this before you and come out on the other side, or maybe even how you've done it before and now you're just repeating it. So obviously you've made it through before. If you enjoyed this week's episode of Hack Your Happiness, please leave us a five-star review from wherever you're listening. It really helps us out and we really appreciate it. Also, we should join our happiness family. It's completely free and we'd love to have you in this way you'll never miss another incredible episode so you can join our happiness family by following this podcast on whichever podcast listening platform you're on now see you next time